you may be concerned about interest rates, bond prices, and all the things that are being published about how insurance companies are going to lose money. You are listening to Wealth Talks with Dr. Tom and John McPhee. We have a special guest for you on the line today, Andrew Wren. He's Vice President of Advanced Markets at Emeritus Life Insurance Company. He has an extensive educational background. He was at Drake University where he made the Dean's List, and he has a number of financial degrees. So we're delighted to welcome uh, Mr. Wren to the show. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good. Great to be here. I know that you have a, a passion about uh, what you do um, with the insurance company Emeritus, and um, I think it's just a great opportunity for us to just discuss what some of this hyperbole is out there about how insurance companies are going to be in trouble because of uh, the upside-down bond market. Yeah, and as an example of that, you know, um, just here on May 15th, the Federal Reserve released their financial stability report. And one of the things that they mentioned in here um, that we'd like you to comment on is the higher, quote, higher levels of leverage at life insurance companies that they're seeing. Uh, They say capitalization of the life insurance sector is expected to deteriorate in coming quarters. What exactly does that mean, and how does that compare to the past number of years? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I've seen that a lot in the media as well, and um, I might take slight issue kind of with the, the assumption of that, that piece, if, if I may. I mean, you have to realize that the vast majority of insurance company investments that back up our product guarantees are in turn backed up by investment-grade bonds. And even the riskier investments, high yield bonds, constitute only a small fraction of our investment portfolio. So we, by our very nature, are very, very conservative. And if we have time, we'll go through a couple easy to understand financial ratios that I'd like to share with both of you to kind of back up that point. But I guess the big thing is, unlike other industries, by our very nature, we're extremely conservative. Our investments back up that conservative nature as well. And it's also, lastly, I want to point out that you don't forget, you know, many, many insurers, including Emeritus, we're mutual insurers. We are not beholden to, uh, like stock companies are, to uh, correlate reports to shareholders. Mm-hmm. So we can afford to be more conservative. We could afford to Think in the long run, not three months ahead, not mm-hmm. six months ahead, but literally two to three years ahead. And that thinking ahead in years and decades, in my humble opinion, has really paid off, especially in the, the current financial crisis that we find ourselves in. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense because, you know, so, if someone is under pressure to produce high results in a short period of time, like a lot of investment portfolios are, then um, they have to assume a higher risk, and that risk then becomes a problem when we're in a market like we are right now. That could not be more uh, true, Tom. And so um, because mutual insurers can think further ahead, can work on behalf of policyholders and not necessarily stockholders, that puts us in a prime position when the unfortunate uh, financial crisis does come, which arguably we're in right now, for us to f- feel a lot more confident about what we could do for our policyholders. And um, articles like that that you referred to just a few moments ago um, are cause for concern, but you also have to look at the type of insurer that you're dealing with. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so you're saying the mutual companies have a lot more flexibility and options, even strength going into the crisis like this than stock held companies would have. Yeah. I mean, I would say that. And just a, just a few numbers to throw at you. This is not going to be a a numbers based um, podcast here today, but um, 95.7% of our investments are backed up by investment grade bonds. And for those listeners, those are highly rated if they're investment grade bonds. That's what they call BBB and higher Mm -hmm. standard and poor. Those are very high grade bonds. The rest of the industry, typically we're looking at 94, 93% 
95%, almost 96% um, for Emeritus, my particular company. They're all very strong. We're in an even stronger position. Um, high yield bonds, arguably somewhat more risky. They should be a small part of your overall portfolio. They're backing up the product guarantees. Um, we're at 4.3%, four, the rest of the industry is higher, 5.3%, 5.4%. So again, kind of underscoring that earlier point for mutual insurers, Emeritus is in the uh, enviable position of being actually more conservative than, than even our peers. That is really fascinating to hear. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read The Black Swan by Nassim Taleb, but he talks about how we should uh, be very conservative in managing our money, keeping most of it in a very secure, guaranteed position, and risking a very small amount so that we might benefit when the black swans occur in the, in the in the market. Yeah, one thing in the black swan uh, event that does happen, you have to think about not only being conservative but also kind of what your uh, debt position is. And mm -hmm. some entities, including insurers, let's be honest, do them, get themselves in a little bit of trouble. Um, mutual insurers, um, and it's okay to brag because I, I do work for one. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's all right. Have, have, That's wonderful. That's they, all we have, have you on the show. <laughs> yeah, they have vir virtually no debt. Virtually no debt. Mm -hmm. So uh, our, our uh, uh, debt to capital ratio is right around... 3.8, which is extraordinarily low. Uh, the rest of the insurance industry, and I'm throwing in the stock companies, is closer to uh, 12. If that gives wow. you any kind of an indication. Yes, exactly. You know, I use that statistic so often with um, prospective clients or clients who are saying, well, this company is, you know, it's not a double rated company or a triple rated company like this one. And we just pull up that surplus notes to capital and surplus ratio and show them, well, look at where we stand. And they don't even know what to say when they see that the company they're boasting about is down there at like 10 or 12 and, and Emeritus is like three, three and a half, four percent. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that typically seals the deal. You can get beyond the industry ratings, and we're very highly rated by AM Best and also S&P. But even above and beyond them, the fiscal and financial ratios really tell the story kind of behind the balance sheet. And that's what I mean about um, the flexibility that an, an insurance company can have that they're a mutual insurer because they do have low debt, because they are not highly leveraged because they do invest in very strong investment-grade bonds and have the flexibility to go ahead and engage in activities that stock insurers uh, don't. One thing that also comes to mind here is that when you do have those black swan events that arguably has, has occurred lately, um, and the general public doesn't know this, along with a lot of equities being dumped in uh, uh, mid to late March and early April, a lot of the uh, high yield bonds were also dumped at the same time. Oh. Like there was a glut, there was a glut of high yield bonds, and those insurers, mutual insurers with strong conservative <laughs> cash positions, were in a great position at that time, without revealing any company secrets here, to take advantage of those glut of high yielding bonds to go ahead and shore up their portfolio even more. So even with uh, interest rate arbitrage and us possibly being in a little bit of a tough position from a from a traditional bond perspective this black swan event put us in a position because of because of the glut of high yield uh, bonds out there to purchase some of those to mm. offset some of that that hit from the lower interest rates in some of our traditional portfolios out there oh that's wonderful that's awesome i, I was not aware of that perspective but that makes total sense from the coming from with a strong cash position like those mutual companies are right now. That, for you that are listening to this podcast, that would be like uh, in 2008 when the real estate bubble crashed here in Las Vegas. You could buy a house for 60% less than its value. And those people that had the cash on hand, they came in and they purchased almost everything under $200,000 in this market. Today, those values of those homes that they purchased have rebounded and some of them um, three and four times what they were in 2008. Um, that's what the position of cash has for you. And of course, it's why we encourage you to, to build cash value life insurance because 
the liquidity that you have in your cash values gives you the opportunity to do the exact same same thing that Andrew is saying right now. Yes. Yeah, Tom, I'm glad you brought that up. And uh, John, I'm sure you were going to make the same point, is cash gives you flexibility. Cash gives you options. And from a product perspective that you, know, you, you just alluded to, that dovetails into the flexibility you have in your own product portfolio. If you have a diverse product portfolio, which a lot of mutual insurers uh, do, especially emeritus, um, you can weather those storms a little bit. Just some quick numbers in preparing for, for today. You know, I'm sure we're all aware that the S&P was down uh, more than 30% um, at its peak. Mm-hmm. But, right, but uh, insurance companies with uh, using index strategies through life insurance and annuities were able to handle events like that. Um, a lot of the strategies that we have out there right now through our index products um, were down 12, 13, 14, 15%, half of what the rest of the market went down because we had the flexibility in our product portfolio, again, because of that conservative cash position, to be able to go ahead and offer that downside protection for those uh, policyholders that, that own, those, own those index products. Mm-hmm. So maybe you can explain this um, to our clients, and this is maybe diverting a little bit from um, our main theme today, but what happens when um, a company, an insurance company, really doesn't encourage or condone policy loans by a policy owner? Why would a company not do that? Because isn't the the policy loan, doesn't that really become part of the portfolio of the insurance company when they take a policy loan? Yeah, it does. And there is a, a number of reasons why an insurer might not feel comfortable with that, including maybe the obvious one, namely um, their own financial forecasting might have put them in a position where they felt like they can go ahead and better invest the monies uh, than a uh, policyholder who might take a withdrawal or, or loan themselves. Mm-hmm. So in their minds, it might shore up their own uh, fiscal balance sheet um, a little bit better, better rather than having a, a customer or consumer take the monies out. But you know, from a macro standpoint, isn't that all part of the part of the uh, value prop um, these days, especially within the context of life insurance? You know, although we might. Um, deny the fact, yeah, you're selling the, the death benefit, but you're also selling the flexibility within yes. the product itself. Part of that flexibility are things like writers, right? Part mm-hmm. of that flexibility are things like loans. Part of the flexibility is being able to take out uh, withdrawals in a in a tax favored tax favored basis. So all that kind of kind of plays into uh, the insurance company. Those companies that um, are not hesitant to allow their policyholders to fully use. Um, all the, the benefits of the policy as it was initially advertised initially are going to be a lot more sticky to those customers going forward and mm-hmm. hopefully get more more clients. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that we really appreciate about, appreciate about working with Emeritus, Andrew, is the, especially the, the whole life products that we use so much with, with customers. The guaranteed values on those products are very, very strong, and they're high. Compared to compared to other products, and that that's money that our, that customers can access and use, especially during down downtimes, crises like this. Those are, that's a source of liquid funds that they can get to and either shore up their existing cash flow, or to go out and find uh, good investments or deals. They have the liquidity in order to do that. That's a huge benefit. What a fun what yeah what a fundamental point that you just made, John, and I think that's huge. Um, you know, we, of course, we had um, the CARES Act, right? Yes. Uh, various fiscal packages passed over the last few months, um, passed an attempt to put you know, money in the hands of average Americans, uh, business owners, you had the PPP and the, and the idle loans, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody likes having to take what they consider to be a, a handout from anybody. That's just not part of our American ethos. That's not part of our, our culture. Mm-hmm. There's nothing more American, in my humble opinion, than financial products 
especially whole life insurance, that buys you that independence, buys you that flexibility so that when it is a rainy day that we're in arguably right now, you can go ahead and pull assets out of your, your own portfolio on your own terms, pay your own interest and do it your own way mm-hmm. rather than being beholden to, to a government entity to go ahead and do that for you. Mm-hmm. So I can't think of a better thing for you to have brought up than the flexibility of things like, like life insurance, especially whole life insurance during a time like this. You know, you just talked about the different acts that Congress has recently passed, and the SECURE Act is one of those where they eliminated the SKIP IRA. And um, uh, I'm of the opinion, along with Ed Slott, that participating whole life insurance now has become the SKIP IRA. Yeah, the stretch. The stretch, the stretch, stretch IRA, IRA the SKIP the stretch, stretch IRA. IRA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's right. And in many cases, except for um, your 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 spouse in unlimited um, trust situations, there's a couple of trust situations where you're still able to stretch it out. But yeah, for all intents and purposes, uh, that stretch IRA, that estate planning tool, um, has now been removed from the the arsenal of, of today's uh, uh, financial uh, advisors. Mm-hmm. But hey, um, there's nothing saying you can't stretch out. Um, an income stream from a from a life insurance policy to get to much the same spot without having to do a trust, without having to do a convoluted um, estate planning technique. And sometimes in our our urgency to um, do the complicated, um, we forget the fundamental that that's that's right in us, especially when it comes mm-hmm. to providing and preserving our, our kids' legacy through such things as life insurance. Yes, absolutely. So switching topics maybe a little bit right now, with everyone thinking uh, during COVID-19 and everything, not only from a financial standpoint, but also from a, a bringing in a little bit of the health perspective now, uh, there, there have been numerous articles in the media, I'm sure you've seen them, uh, where, they're, where the articles are questioning the strength of the insurance companies and whether they will even accept people for insurance anymore with the higher health risks. Um, that are that are seen to be associated with the pandemic. Um, what is the? I know Emeritus is in a strong position in that respect, even rolling out the accelerated underwriting. Would you Would you talk a little bit about that and uh, explain why, how these articles have come to be written and where Emeritus stands on this? Yes, certainly. And this is a hot topic, an area that I think we're all very, very passionate on, especially if you're on the the insurance side uh, of the court. Um, I'm not going to say those articles are necessarily meant to mislead, but I think many of the the writers, unfortunately, are are ill-informed. That's the Mm -hmm. importance of this podcast and kind of getting the the word out there. Um, A couple things. Please do not underestimate the virtual efficiencies that all insurers have instituted over the last two months. It's been it's been a whirlwind, a whirlwind, and it's been, a, it's been amazing. And articles are going to be written about this this eight week time period where essentially the insurance carriers were forced to go virtual in a hurry. Mm-hmm. So we've gotten lots of efficiencies there. Accelerated underwriting, which you just referred to, John, is is one of them. Um, we're able to go ahead now and dispense with many of the traditional face-to-face um, doctor visits that we had previously and through some smart underwriting, some good questionnaires, and some virtual research, <laughs> we've been able to go ahead and offer um, more than adequate life insurance for the vast majority of um, potential policyholders out there. Mm-hmm. If anything, um, it's been a more open, streamlined, and smart environment that we have before. But I don't, I don't want to whitewash it either. Yeah, there are certain select classes. Um, typically, they're going to be individuals that are older, might have pre-existing uh, respiratory or health issues. And yes, sure. any good, smart, fiscally sound insurer is going to have to be sensitive to that because they have a you know moral, ethical op- opportunity here to go ahead and do the right thing. And we've done the, the right thing here. And other mm-hmm. insurers have as well. We don't have a monopoly on that. We've developed more detailed health questionnaires, asked more detailed questions of individuals you know, applying for insurance. So we can go ahead and figure out 
who best to insure now? And sometimes the, the answer is not no, it's perhaps a little bit later, perhaps, mm-hmm. you know, come, come back four, six, eight weeks. More than often, that's the answer. So unlike what you might be hearing in the press out there, uh, we become more streamlined, we become smarter. Um, our life insurance portfolio continues to grow. And, you know, in a ironic sort of twist of fate, um, this this pandemic has really opened up the doors to us to underwriting actually larger cases and doing it more efficiently than ever before. That's um, wonderful. You know, um, and not to uh, to demean the amount of people that have lost their life to COVID, but when we look historically at pandemics that have affected the world, um, statistically, there is not that many people that have succumbed to this disease as have in past epidemics or a few past epidemics. So how did uh, how did insurance companies survive the the flu in 1918? Did they come through? Did they pay dividends? Were they still profitable? Did they still pay death benefits? Yeah, they did. And that's, you know, being a, a lawyer myself, that is a, you are leading the witness, but I think you are, <laughs> <laughs> you're correct because kind of within your question, uh, therein lies the truth. Dividends were paid. Claims were paid. Insurance companies stayed fiscally strong stayed vigilant, much like today, um, instituted procedures and technologies which were cutting edge back in 1918 that allowed them to better underwrite and better discern their own risk. So this this event, this Box One event, um, has done much the same thing. For those of us that are um, students of history, things always come full circle. So much like, you know, 101, 102 years ago, um, we in the insurance industry are in a position now to stand out among, amongst the crowd and deliver true policyholders. I think now in a more effective, more humane way than, 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 than ever before. Mm-hmm. So we're very strong and we'll continue to be strong going forward. And that's wonderful. Well, thank you for thank you very much for taking the time to share on the podcast today. We appreciate your insight and perspective on what's happening behind the scenes with the insurance companies uh, during these times. Are there any final words that you'd like to um, to leave us with today? Um, just a few high overall thoughts. Um, feel confident about the industry that we're in. I hope those of you that are listening to this podcast feel very good about the decisions insurers, mutual insurers have made over the last 15, 20, 25 years. We haven't always been on the glitzy end of how to develop um, products to the American consumer, although we've showed significant innovation over, I'd say, the last five, five or six years. But the quid pro quo for that is being in a strong, fiscally conservative spot right now to deliver and to deliver what? deliver on our promises. And so we have a theme that uh, Merit is called fulfilling life. So we're in a position now more than ever before to fulfill life for our, our very best customers. Well, as an independent agent who represents several companies, Emeritus came out with two very, very strong products at the beginning of this year that have just have phenomenal cash values and a flexibility in them for um, those who want to own and use participating in a life insurance policy to build a state and a legacy. It's just um, um, whoever your product development managers are and team, they need to be really um, given some kudos. Absolutely. That's, that's, an, uh, that's an unpaid endorsement. I like to think we have some of the best in the industry working for Emeritus. I appreciate you saying that. Uh, those, those two products are really um, just been – awesome for us to be able to to sell to our clients. Absolutely. They are wonderful. All right. So you're listening to Wealth Talks with Dr. Tom and John McPhee. Thank you, Mr. Wren, for joining us today. And we'll be back here next week. Have a wonderful week. 